10,000 airline seats are sold. Next year, the fold. Flying is no longer insurer's pastime. It's becoming an accepted means of public transportation. Many enthusiasts are designing tomorrow's Douglas, Lockheed, Boeing, Orsky. There are dozens whose aerodynamics, his congressman, tries the direct approach. His craft is a cross between a Model T and a flying saucer. This fellow's on to something with real potential, the rocket, helped by an afterburner who's more after than burner. Finally, a man of penetrating vision, a dedicated spaceman considerably ahead of his time. In 1929, a flight to Los Angeles is leaving from track 16 at New York's Penn Station. Night flying is still too hazardous for the commercial passengers. Overnight laps in Pullman berths, daytime segments by plane. Morning, Columbus, Ohio. Now the hectic shuffling between station and airport begins. Exhilarating way to travel, but will their spirits still soar after landing at Indianapolis, St. Louis, and Kansas City? <music> Air ground radio has not yet developed trade terms like Roger Wilco and over and out. Radio chatter is highly informal. T.A.T. Maddox, radio ground station at Wichita. Westbound plane reporting position. We are now passing over Granville. Okay on your position. Are you on time? Go ahead, please. We are flying exactly on schedule. We'll arrive at Wichita on time. Okay, goodbye. So long. After Wichita comes Wainoka, Oklahoma. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe sleeper stops here, and our pioneers are drooping. First, a dusty ride to the depot. They roll into Clovis, New Mexico at 8.20 a.m. The line is TAT, a predecessor of TWA. Now lunch and flight, a modish, but another of the line's innovation. Albuquerque. A brief rest from the buzz of the props. Two Arizona stops, then the final lap to Los Angeles. A two-day trip, 11 stops in all, but it beats the fastest train by a day. Still, is it worth $350? Plane from New York and the East, arriving 420 on time. Parallel with expansion across the country, airline routes are being thrust overseas. 
1931, Anne and Charles Lindbergh set out to explore new routes for Pan American. For two years, he's been helping the airline push south through the Caribbean and Central America. This trip is more ambitious and hazardous. It will take the Lindberghs north to the Orient, New York to China, over the rooftop of the world. Russia on another route survey. Not so glittering these trips as Lindbergh's hop to Paris, yet some think them equally significant. Like no one else, Lindbergh has both fired public interest in flight and speeded airway expansion. Now there is intense interest in seaplanes. This morass of propellers and struts is an early experiment, the 12 engine DOX. Designed in Germany, but built in Switzerland to circumvent the Versailles Treaty, she carries 169 persons on one test flight. But even with 12 engines, she's short on power and won't make the grade as an airliner. The Sikorsky S-42, America's first big flying boat. Even ships like this need big government subsidies to support operations. In the engineering labs, meantime, a masterpiece is taking shape. An airliner that will be faster than anything before her, safer and much more economical. The first transport able without subsidy to turn a profit. The Douglas DC-3. She will cruise at 185, carry 21 passengers. In 1936, she's ready. Mrs. Roosevelt christens a DC-3. Eddie Rickenbacker of Eastern Airlines lends a hand. I christen you New York Flyer and take great pleasure in thus participating in the inauguration of Eastern Airlines' new 20 round trips daily between Washington and New York. I hope you heard. I don't really. Oh, that's. In 18 months, the DC 3 dominates the world scene like British tea and Italian marble. Most of the major airlines order her for their fleets. In the U.S., the transcontinental trip is cut to three stops. Take off in time for dinner, and you're in Los Angeles in the morning. There are even berths on board. The one-way fare is down to $150, a match for the railroad. Good night. Good night. Airline travel, formerly a rich man's lark is beginning to attract a wider public. But the real blue sky future still lies ahead. Wake up, it's time to get up and dress. By 1941, American commercial aviation is well established. While four-engine land planes are making a token first appearance, four-engine flying boats are winging across both oceans. Traffic over the Atlantic is especially brisk as diplomats, generals, businessmen, and refugees leapfrog Nazi U-boats. For the Pacific run to Hong Kong, Pan American, with Navy encouragement, has established bases at remote islands such as Guam and Wake. Here, a clipper sets down at Wake. Ground crew uniform is informal. While passengers look around, 
and not much to see, the clipper is checked and refueled for the next leg to Guam. Twenty minutes out of wake, radio channels throb with a coded message. All U.S. airliners head for pre-designated fields. It is December 7th, 1941. As the United States goes to war, so do the airlines. Half of their 400 planes and many of their top executives switch to Army and Navy airlines. The Army's Air Transport Command grows into a colossus, many times the size of all the nation's pre-war carriers. Its fleet expands to 3,000 planes. Its web of routes touches 200 bases. It hauls millions of passengers, millions of tons of cargo. With peace, the airlines capitalize on the war's advances. Impressive new planes, DC-4, 6, and 7, Constellation, Stratocruiser. New air-minded customers. War-financed runways on trans-ocean routes, runways allowing 300-mile-an-hour land planes to handle overwater service. By 1947, 21 million world passengers. By 1957, 87 million. Airports resemble international grand hotels.
is scarcely a country on earth not touched by commercial aviation. For those who fly, the world is at the window. course meal at 20,000 feet always has a special quality, even though it's one of the minor miracles of flight. The piston plane gets bigger, faster, more and more luxurious. Then, in an industry that traditionally moves swiftly, she becomes a hard-to-move item on the second-hand market. A new kind of plane overtakes her. The conventional prop plane begins to abdicate gracefully. The new plane is the jet. Inflate a balloon, release the nozzle, and watch the balloon skitter across the room. Jet thrust is similar, much more powerful than a thrashing propeller. It will bring other continents as close as weekend resorts. Britain rushes the commercial jet age a bit, introduces the Comet 1 in 1952. She has a speed of 500 miles an hour, great public appeal, and tragically, fatal flaws in design. A comet crashes near Rome. The following year, two more go down in the Middle East. Finally, after two explosions, the Comet 1 is permanently grounded. Tests show that repeated pressurizing produces metal fatigue. This is the phenomenon that breaks off the top of a tin can when it is bent back and forth. On a Comet 1, metal fatigue bursts open the cabin. Months of testing remedy this flaw in the new Comet models. The turboprop, jet power harnessed to propellers, offers a more gradual transition. The jet's huge advantages over pistons are offered to a lesser extent by the turboprop. Higher speed, less cabin noise, less vibration. Britain's Viscount and Britannia and America's Lockheed Electra lead the turboprop field. The astonishing jet at last comes into its own in 1959. New York to Paris, seven hours. Here's America's Boeing 707. The Comet 4, Britain proudly keeps the name. Francis Caravel. Russia's TU-104, already a three-year veteran. The DC-8, latest in the Douglas line. The Convair 880, capable of 615 miles an hour, fastest of the lot. Pilots learn jet flying in a device called the simulator. It duplicates everything on a real flight, including emergency alarms and turbulent air. Pilots deal with engine flameouts, icing, and stuck gear. It's cheaper than actual flying. And if somebody flips the wrong switch, no need for the crash wagon. They can even get the feel of landing at an unfamiliar airport. A television camera scans a model of the runway. The TV picture is then relayed to the windshield of the simulator. A trainee can put down at Frankfurt, Lima, and Tokyo in a 15-minute lesson.
jets present several special problems. Disturbance to nearby communities is one. These organ pipes help cut down outside noise. The thin air at jet altitudes won't support light. If pressure fails, oxygen masks automatically pop down to be worn until the plane dives to a livable atmosphere. The jet's accent on speed has forced planners to do something about the slow business of baggage handling. Until the jet's arrival, this process had changed little since Cleopatra boarded her barge for a trip down the Nile, one piece of luggage at a time. Now jet baggage is loaded in packets of 40, and the human muscle, a machine that antedates even Cleopatra, is finally replaced by a mechanical winch. Some things, however, persist into the jet age, probably will never change, even though commercial aviation has come a long way since Mrs. Roosevelt christened the DC-3. More than 20 years later, Mrs. Nixon performs the same ritual on a jet. Whole fleets of jet airliners carrying as many as 150 passengers are now scorching the skies, compressing the world so that no place is more than a day from any place else, carrying premier Hawaiians to Honduras, people to people. It's generally accepted that suspicion of the stranger feeds world tensions. But more and more, strangers are meeting as these giants leap the gear, perhaps, lies the greatest promise in the age of the jet. Thank you.